Scandinavian mythology is filled to the brim with various terrifying monsters and spirits, some of which you know about already. Trolls, dwarves, draugr, and whatnot. Today I've got some allegedly true and scary stories of people who claim to have encountered strange creatures and entities that seem to have come right out of Scandinavian folklore. Enjoy. And hey, if you want more scary goodness between episodes, be sure to check out Freaky Folklore and Redwood Bureau, a couple of other spooky podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and EerieCast.com. Now, let's begin. Stalked in the Northern Woods from Joel W. The year was 2009. I was 19 years old and had just finished my formal education near Stockholm. I've always been fascinated by history. Our different ancient crafts and material handiwork in particular has a special place in my heart. This interest of mine had me traveling up north, up to the endlessly billowing seas of never-ending forests and deep valleys, to attend a folk high school. This school was pretty much like you'd imagine J.K. Rowling's Hogwarts, but for ancient crafts instead of magic. No matter how eerie this particular instance might have been, I still look back on my years in this place as some of the best years in my life. We did everything from fire making to herbalism, flint napping to bronze casting, iron making from ore that we dug up ourselves as well as forging said iron and steel into useful tools. Needless to say, I was in heaven. Barely a single day in two years felt wasted. It was the year that I found my element in the forge as a bladesmith. However, there came a day, just like so many other days, that I decided to take an evening stroll through the surrounding woods, up the path to the overlook of the valley in which the school was situated. By then, I had familiarized myself with the surroundings, and I breathed in the fresh air of the northern woods as I weaved between the bare pine trunks. The tall trees created this majestic hall of straight pillars with a dark green roof, through which the still blue sky could be seen. You could see so far ahead and around since there wasn't anything taller than a blueberry bush on the ground. I followed the trail up and down a ridge before entering a small moor. A narrow path made of carefully joined planks made the walk across nice and effortless, and I very much enjoyed the earthy, fresh scent of moss and the wind that found its way over the damp bog. I was rewarded at the other end with a great patch of ripe red lingonberries and a small spring that sprung up from a rock face ahead. The water in these undisturbed places tastes truly amazing. Someone had left a handmade ladle made of a fir twig and some birch bark on a branch beside the spring. After a few cold and wonderfully refreshing gulps, I flushed the ladle in the running water and hung it back in its place. Everything was right in the world. Well, almost everything. Just an arm's length from the ladle branch, something had gotten stuck on a jumble of jagged twigs. It almost looked to be hanging beard moss, and I almost wrote it off as such, since it grows everywhere up in those deep woods. But something made me look closer. Among all the familiar scents of the forest, there was something else, something that sent a needle prick into the back of my mind, a sensation that I could simply not immediately understand. Looking back, I now understand that what I felt was my old human instincts trying to make me aware of a danger that my modern mind simply would not register as a possibility. In front of me was a tuft of greenish-gray hair. It looked coarse and filthy and I realized that what made me react was the smell it gave off. Trying to describe it is hard, because I'd never experienced anything like it, nor have I since. The closest I can think of is the scent of old urine in a subway corner mixed with a warm, slightly sweet smell. Now that I think about it, although there may not be that many of you who can relate, I have butchered a few roosters in my days, it was similar to the smell of fresh, warm innards. I probably don't need to tell you that this kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not a squeamish guy by any standard, but whatever this was, it had a repelling effect on my entire being. 
I gave the thing a wide berth and continued my walk up the hill ahead of me. This was the final stretch before arriving at the lookout. During the winter, this path up the ridge of the valley is nearly impossible to traverse, since it gets covered in waist-deep snow and slick patches of ice. However, this was just between summer and autumn, so the way was clear. The tall firs and pines slowly got shorter and shorter, and gradually mingled with yellowing birches and aspen. The forest canopy got lower and lower to the ground, and opened up slightly, so it lightened up a bit, even though the day was growing late. One thing that you'll notice about Sweden are the random boulders pretty much everywhere. Huge rocks that just sit there, without any obvious place of origin or explanation of how they got there. Back in the days of stories and folklore, these rocks were called giant's throws, or troll rocks. The implication was that giants or trolls had been throwing these rocks to fend off invaders, or to challenge rivals for territory. However, I knew in the back of my head that the random rock formations of Sweden mostly stand as a result of the fact that pretty much the entirety of the land once was covered in ice, which moved and shaped the ground into what we see today. While musing over these thoughts, I let my hand run across the coarse surface of one of the stone sentinels, feeling the residual warmth of the evening sun. Days were short in this place, and it was soon time to head back. I looked up ahead and saw the clean open sky of the lookout point. I must admit that I've never been in great shape, and my breath came heavy by the time I arrived at the top of the ridge. There, on the moss-covered plateau of stone, stood a small, lonely, and crooked pine, and under it, a simple wooden bench facing the valley below. Many had made their mark in the bench, and I wasn't going to pass my chance to leave a little memory. Every student of this school was pretty much expected to always carry a knife for various tasks, often knives that we'd made ourselves, so the process was somehow made even more special by that little detail. I believe that bench still stands there today. I sat down to enjoy the last rays of sunlight as it slowly sank behind the valley ridges. It was so clear that I could see Norway on the horizon. It was then that I took a deep breath. Expecting the fresh, clear air, my nose instinctively wrinkled as it was assaulted by a foreign odor. It took my brain a moment to register that it wasn't just a glitch of my senses, but something that persisted and gradually intensified. Up until that moment, my blood had been pumping from the walk up the incline. My head and ears had both been occupied by the rhythm and whispers of my heart and circulation. Now, however, it was like my instincts told me to sharpen my senses and be quiet. I was most certainly not the only thing that felt that way. Suddenly all the noises and calls of the forest let themselves be drowned out by gently whispering wind. What was a serene, beautiful, and safe place a second ago had turned into something threatening. I could feel the hairs on my arms stand up. Never in my life had I felt this exposed, this vulnerable. Never had I felt the pinpricks of being watched. This was an entirely new experience for me, and I didn't like it one bit. A bear, I thought, as my eyes darted from one corner of my periphery to the next. I didn't dare move my head. While on a hike, me and my class had been followed by a bear cub once. No matter how cute and adorable the situation might have been, we quickly marched to another location since we knew that Mama Bear wouldn't be far off, and she'd probably prefer if we kept our distance. Bears are fairly common up in these parts, so it was possible that's what I was picking up on. To be fair, I'd never sniffed a bear before. As the moments passed by, I waited as if frozen on the spot for the feeling to pass. It didn't. On the contrary, the wind changed direction and started blowing from my left, from where I'd come just a few minutes earlier. The stench struck me, and I had to concentrate not to exclaim my disgust. Slowly, I let my head turn to the side. Darkness had begun to fall, and the colors began to bleed into one another giving way to dusk. Shapes and forms shifted and quivered in the wind, and I started to truly regret coming out here so late. 
One of the shapes, which I first thought was a stubby and bearded fir tree, didn't move, however. It stood stock still. The rotten smell hung heavy in the air. I couldn't look away. As my gaze concentrated on this shape, a few variations started to manifest. It was difficult to make out, partly obscured behind the needled branches of other fir trees. But this is what I can remember from that moment. It was tall. Compared to the trees around it, it might just as well have been as big as 16 feet. One of the most striking features was the absence of a neck. Almost obelisk in shape, it seemed like it had long hair that hung down from its head and draped over its shoulders. In the middle of what must have been its face sat a gigantic misshapen nose. Behind the curtain of moss-like hair, two deep sockets of deeper darkness held one tiny glimmer of reflection each. At the same moment my eyes met those expressionless points, I knew I'd made a big mistake. The shoulders of the thing began to rise, and I heard a deep, raspy intake of air. I saw its arms then, as they left their hanging position along its sides. They must have almost reached down to the ground. So grotesque and long they were. With a loud thump, it took one step forward and lifted its arms, like a toddler that reaches for its favorite toy or snack. I didn't think, I didn't feel, I didn't care. I was up on my feet in the same instant. The next moment was a blur as I must have thrown myself down the steep slope of rock just in front of me. Too steep to walk up, but much more lenient towards a quick and tumultuous descent. Lucky enough for me, it was quite smooth, but I still got pretty beat up by the tumble. As soon as the slope started to level out, I got up on my feet. The right side of my hip, my right elbow, and my left ankle had taken the brunt of the fall. I limped forward as fast as my legs would carry me. I would later find out that my foot had been sprained, and it still aches now and then, popping when I roll it around. But at that moment, I must have been high as a kite on adrenaline. I looked back up the ridge, because you always look back. But that thing wasn't up there. This made me pick up my pace even more. By throwing myself down the slope, I'd taken a significant shortcut. The downside was I now had to run through untrodden terrain. My heart skipped a beat when I suddenly heard what sounded like two massive feet getting closer. I thought I could feel the vibrations in my teeth. I almost yelled out as I thundered through the blueberry bushes, between the pillars of pine, under the now black profiles of needled canopies, and finally saw the glimmering lights of the school buildings. Along with the coming footfalls and tremors in the earth, came the raspy breathing from before. I forced myself to keep my gaze forward, tears escaping the corners of my eyes, just as much from exertion as from the absolute terror I felt. I flew over the ditch and ran across the road, passing the bus station and into the school's entrance walk. That's when I realized how quiet it was. No footfall, no breathing, no birdsong, nothing. I turned and looked back, only to be greeted by the vast empty forest on the other side of the road. Upon losing the sense of absolute immediate danger, my ankle began to scream in pain. My breath came in short, deep gasps, and I fell on my backside where I stood. My body simply refused to move any further. When I looked up again and gazed into the dark, I realized it wasn't as empty as my oxygen-deprived brain made it out to be. There, a few steps into the forest, blending in with the trunks in the dark, stood the obelisk shape. I thought I still could see the large nose and sunken shark-like eyes in there. However, as soon as I started to make it out again, it seemed to fade, as if slowly gliding back into the dark, never releasing me from its stare. After a few more painful heartbeats, the sounds of late evening washed over my surroundings, it was as if a cold hand around my throat had been removed and I could breathe freely again. Well, not really. I still gasped after my neck-breaking sprint, but it felt as if the air around me was cleaner, richer. A friend of mine came out of one of the buildings and helped me up. I got my ankle looked after and I had a long, warm shower to ease my nerves before bed.
This horrifying feeling never came over me again, and slowly I got confident enough to go back into the forest. But I'll never brave the dusk or night out there ever again. So the next time you hear of the old creatures out in the woods, take heed and listen. Be vigilant, and try to avoid being out alone in the northern woods during dusk or night. There are trolls out there, and you may not be as lucky as I was that day. Take care. Full Moon Sleepover From Tear. Quick note, I think I narrated the story in the past. After someone on my subreddit asked where to find the narration, I couldn't locate it, so I'm just going to re-narrate it here. Enjoy. My name is Tyr. My name might be a little strange. I live in Sweden, like in the most northern part of Sweden, that doesn't have a lot of contact with the outside world. Of course we have technology, but it was just very limited. This happened in the early 90s, during my childhood. I lived in a small community out in the middle of the forest. I want to point out the fact that you could literally walk here for miles without seeing a single house. Our community was one of the only modern places you could find out there. I had a happy life. I lived with my mother, father, and two sisters, as well as a dog named Rufus in a small red house. We were happy. My parents loved each other, and my sisters didn't try to kill me. We had enough money to survive. It was all in all a very happy time of our lives. But one incident would change that. One thing would destroy our worryless world. There were about 20 small houses in our community back then. The population was mostly made up of old retired hunters or woodcutters. But there were some families with children too. There was Andreas, Mia, Eric, Anders, and Ingmar. Me, my sisters, and the rest of these children were all around the same age, maybe around 10 to 13. All of us were great friends, as there weren't exactly so many people to be friends with. We all went to the same school that was situated very far away from our community. So every day we'd sit underneath the trees and wait for the school bus, talking crap and eating candy like kids do. The girl that mostly talked with my two sisters, Mia, was a very nice person. She was often quite serious, but she'd always been a pretty gentle soul. When I, for example, had forgotten to do my homework, she would help me out so that I didn't fail. I think I had maybe a small crush on her too, but pretty much all the boys in our group did, so I didn't really bother to try to make her be my girlfriend or something like that. Overall, she wasn't someone that really stood out in a group. She was always just quiet and focused on what to do next. One Friday after school, we had all decided to have a sleepover at Eric's house. Eric's house was probably the biggest in the community, and the most isolated. We all brought pillows, pajamas, and tons of junk food, and movies, so we could stay up all night. At that age, we thought it was so cool to be up so late. Anyway, we arrived at the house and everything seemed normal. We were laughing and having a great time. Everyone seemed to be happy except for Mia. I remember all of us dancing when Mia stormed off to the bathroom. One of my sisters followed her and asked her if she was alright. She'd only given a weak yes as an answer to my sister when she sat down on the floor. My sister, weirded out, went back to the rest of us. We all just of course assumed maybe she was sick or sad about something, maybe something to do with her parents. Then again, I'd met Mia's parents before and they were really nice people. They'd even once planned a trip for all of our families to go to Norway whale watching. Going on such a big holiday was very nice of them and very expensive. Maybe a little too nice, I guess. So maybe she was just feeling sick, I thought. Around 3pm, Mia began to get stranger. She began to stand on the side of the room, and her eyes seemed to change. They became almost white or silvery. She started to really creep us out. We asked her if she wanted to sit down with us, and that's when everything spiraled out of control. She screamed no. It was the highest I'd ever heard her scream, and I'd seen her before being bitten by a dog. Mia then just ran out of the door. 
We all chased after her. Mia ran out between the trees next to the house. It's really dark out during Swedish autumns, but we ran after her either way in only our pajamas. None of us understood what was happening to Mia. She acted berserk. She started screaming some gibberish while running. That was when I think that I began to notice something about Mia. She was probably the slowest person in our school. Not exactly fit, she was quite the opposite, a little chubby. But now when Mia ran between the pine trees, she was running faster than anyone could keep up with. I tried my best to, screaming at her with all my power, trying to get her to stop running. The rest of our friends had lagged behind now. After a while of trying to keep up with her, I saw Mia beginning to run on all fours. She was now faster than before. Despite the speed, I kept running. I think this went on for about an hour, before I was finally running out of breath. I was in pretty good shape myself back then. But at that point, I just wanted to stop. I wanted to try to make sense of everything, like the weird stuff Mia was spouting. Just when I thought I was about to pass out from exhaustion, Mia stopped. At last, she finally slowed down. She just stood still there with the moonlight touching her face. I screamed at her in anger. Why are you running away from us, you idiot? But she didn't respond. She just stood there with her gaze on the moon. I remember it being a beautiful yellow full moon night. Then Mia began to walk up a little hill. There, she just stood for several minutes, her back turned towards me. I was really starting to get scared now. The forest was dark, and this was the time of year when wolves were most active. My friends had now finally caught up to us. We all just stared at Mia, who stood completely motionless, like a statue on top of that moonlit hill. Eventually, she turned around, looking out into the darkness of the trees behind us. I swear then my heart stopped. It's hard to describe the following events. I remember my friends and I beginning to lift off the ground with sticks and moss. We panicked and screamed for Mia to help us, but she stood there, seemingly unaffected. It was as if she couldn't hear our cries. Then something else happens that haunts me to this day. Behind Mia, a creature or person stood completely still. It was much taller than her, and very pale, as if the creature hadn't seen the sun for years. Eventually, this person moved towards her, standing next to her. Now I could see it in detail. It looked human, but it was very skinny and had long black hair that covered the creature's front. This creature was definitely female. It had an hourglass figure and breasts. Still, it wasn't a pretty sight. While the face looked very human, it had these very large black eyes that just stared at us. I had no idea what this thing was. Then, the creature turned around, showing us its back. I expected to see a thin skeletal frame with the spine poking through, but instead, there was a big hole on her back, like something you would see on a very old tree. I'll note here that I immediately thought that I knew what this old creature was. In Swedish mythology, we have something called raw. They're some sort of protectors of the forest that take on the shape of beautiful women to lure men out into the woods to never be seen again. The raw's most notable feature except its beauty, was that it had a hole in its back. However, this thing looked anything but beautiful. Not long after, it turned around, revealing its back to us. Both it and Mia disappeared. Afterwards, we all fell to the ground. None of us wanted to stay there, so we just ran the fastest we could out of there. I don't think I've ever in my life ran as fast as I did then. I just wanted to run all the way home, and so I did with my sisters. Back at our home, my sisters and I looked at each other. None of us told our parents what happened that night. We just went to bed, seemingly in shock, pretending that nothing had happened, though I'm sure none of us actually slept that night. The weekend after, 
everything seemed normal. We went to school, but we all just kept quiet about the story. And yeah, Mia was there. She'd apparently forgotten everything about the sleepover. I think that she maybe had just pulled a sick prank on all of us, but I wasn't convinced. Well, after a while, we all sort of stopped being friends. I, who had been happy with everything before, had begun to get huge psychological problems. I began to doubt what was real and what was fiction. This destroyed many years with my family. My illness began getting better. I moved to a big city to study with my sisters, and we all just wanted to stick together. After living there for many years, we found Mia on Facebook. It was my oldest sister that found her. She lived not so far from us, actually, so we decided to meet up with her after all these years. We decided on where in town to meet. Mia would meet us at our favorite lunch place in town. I guess I thought we could sit down and talk and clear some things up between us, but that's not really how it turned out. Mia walked in through the door with another woman. She introduced us to her girlfriend. Her girlfriend seemed normal, except for the fact that I thought I recognized her. And eventually it hit me. Mia's girlfriend looked exactly like the creature we'd seen with her that night when we were kids, if she was all cleaned up and more human looking. The rest of the meetup was as normal as it could be. Some small talk about what we studied and how our families were. But the face of that woman, it still haunts me. Both my sisters and I are okay today. I will never go back into the forest, and I probably won't let my kids go out to the woods alone either. Midnight Wake Up Call From Sparkling Sea Cucumber I was born and raised in Sweden, but both my parents are from different parts of Finland. All relatives on my father's side originally came from a small village close to Vasa. It's a small village where everyone knows each other and basically everyone is related in some form or another. In those parts of Finland, the population speaks Swedish, as well as learning Finnish in school. When I was a kid, we often visited my grandparents on my father's side during summer vacation, Easter, or Christmas. I have many fond memories from that time, but there were moments where I was truly frightened. As a kid, I was really scared of the dark, ghosts, aliens, murder dolls, and spiders. I often had frightening dreams where it felt as if I was awake, but I was in fact dreaming. I could lie there in the dark and see how shadows moved, or imagine my bed filled with spiders. I had dreams where I heard footsteps, loud mumbling whispers, or felt as if the bed had moved. I sometimes saw objects move or pictures becoming warped. I could also move freely so it wasn't a form of sleep paralysis. These dreams usually happened when I was scared and stressed while being sleep deprived. That being said, my sister and I have been through some weird stuff that we can't fully explain. Those things happened when we were both wide awake. Some of these things have been second nature while others stick out more. It could happen at home or when we were visiting our grandparents, as well as our mom. With all that in mind, the story begins as me, my father, and younger sister arrived in Finland. Dad was driving the whole way from the harbor. I believe it was late autumn, but it's hard to be sure since my memory is pretty hazy and our frequent travels blended together at times. But I know it was getting darker, and summers in northern Sweden as well as Finland are very bright until autumn. We were tired, but had stuffed ourselves with candy as we usually did when we took the boat. I can't remember how old I was back then, maybe around 10 or 11 or a bit older. My sister was five years younger than me. As we finally drove down to the gravel walk to a red two-story house, there was a lamp lit in the window facing the road. Grandma had the habit of staying up and serving us with sandwiches and tea or hot chocolate while asking about the trip, while Grandpa usually kept snoring in the bedroom next to the kitchen. When we arrived, we were all pretty tired, but we stayed up for a little bit, talking and carrying in luggage. As we say goodnight, we took our luggage upstairs where there were three guest rooms. My sister and I slept in the second room while dad had the first room. 
I always picked the bed closest to the door for some reason, and my sister took the other bed. After brushing our teeth and changing into pajamas, we went to sleep. As usual, I had a hard time sleeping. I kept thinking that some crawling ghost would be coming from the stairs, which was even scarier since I had full view of the staircase. I also began to think about murder dolls, since there was a Victorian-styled porcelain doll placed outside the room on the wall. My imagination was running wild. I was sweating, my pulse going crazy. It took me forever to calm down. Then I slowly started to drift off to sleep, when suddenly there was this loud scream. It sounded as if someone was screaming right into my ear, but it didn't sound human. It sounded unnatural and mechanical. It's hard to describe. I was so startled that I sat up in bed and noticed that my sister was also awake now. I even heard my dad and grandparents moving around in their rooms. We turned on the lamp and just looked at each other in disbelief. We were scared. We'd all heard it. What just happened and what was it? It didn't sound like something from outside. None of us had screamed. And even more disturbing, my grandpa, who was basically deaf when he took out his hearing aid, had heard the scream too. There were no intruders either. My dad blamed it on some malfunctioning wire or something else. My dad always blamed stuff on something else even though it didn't make sense. He was a skeptic. He claimed that the brain played tricks on people or he would just blame rats. But this, we were all hearing this sound and we all felt as if someone or something had screamed into our ears. We all woke at the same time. I'm not sure what the logical explanation would be. I had an even harder time relaxing after that. I kept wondering what kind of creature could do that, and if it was going to scream again. I don't know how long it took me to fall asleep, but I do remember waking up in the morning, and since that time, we never heard the scream again. Was it something natural? Supernatural? I have no idea. I wish it had been just one of my nightmares. That brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. More terrifying stories are on the way soon, so subscribe and smash that like button. By the way, did you know this show is available as a podcast called Unexplained Encounters? Just search for, follow, and rate Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. This show is part of the EerieCast network. Go to EerieCast.com for more scary podcasts, such as Freaky Folklore, which explores your favorite monsters, myths, and mysteries, as well as Redwood Bureau, a fictional horror podcast about an agent on the run from an evil secret organization that captures supernatural creatures and entities. Well, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one. <laughs>